Marriage Broker Randy presents Behind the Scenes. This is an audio series documenting the lives of happily married couples who've committed to spending their every day building healthy relationships. Growing up, we've listened to countless stories that end with meeting your soulmate, getting married and living happily ever after. But is that all to relationships? We're here to find out more. We hope to unravel marriage through stories of real relationships. I'm your host Priyanka Bhardwaj, founder and CEO of Marriage Broker Anti, which is a matrimonial advisory and relationship coaching service. What you're about to hear is an unscripted conversation with a couple who graciously come forward to share their relationship story. My name is Simran Mangaram and uh, I'm married to Siddharth Mangaram and together we actually founded a dating slash relationship real life community for singles where we actually got single people to meet in real life through the events that we organized and these events were very interactive from cooking to mixology to hiking to quizzing we had over 7000 people who got married through flow uh, and and it was uh, an absolute joy and of course we're on a pause right now due to the pandemic now i do a lot of relationship coaching for singles and uh, i also write a regular column in hindustan times which is called with love i grew up in bangalore and went around the block like most folks in bangalore tend to do and and then decided that bangalore was really the best place in the world to be in so came back here we have a 10 almost 11 year old daughter we ran flow from 2011 through 2020 so it was uh, almost a decade long endeavor for us and like simran says we we really enjoyed that experience and of course the pandemic put paid to a lot of our plans and so i now work with a company called live kindly which is a global plant protein fmcg company my job is to make plant protein the the new norm in india through my efforts with the, the live kindly collective My guests today are Simran and Siddharth Mangaram, a couple based in Bangalore. They are the co-founders of Flow, a very popular singles community in India. Simran and Siddharth met at a house party in 2007, where they bonded over a platter of cheese. Their relationship was never meant to have any sort of commitment to begin with, but they eventually not only went on to get married themselves, but even started a company that has helped thousands of single people find their life partners in the most organic way possible they may have sparked the beginning of thousands of relationships but we had the privilege of learning about what sparked their relationship and how they continue to keep that spark alive years into their marriage So we've known each other since 2007 so that's 14 years now. yeah yeah we actually met at a friend's place and um, there was a party and and I love cheese and and there was a platter of cheese and I was attacking the blue cheese which wasn't so popular at that time in 2007 in India and uh, that comes by and he says oh, is this blue cheese and I was like yeah and we just started having a conversation we were talking for a while I didn't know his name he didn't know my name <laughs> but i asked my friend about uh, this guy and he said you know he's a good boy <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> perhaps too good for you <laughs> you know that's what my friend told me when i asked for an inter- <laughs> like asked for his number or like how do i get to meet this guy again and then of course we got connected and that invited himself over to my house because i just come back from turkey and you know and i love cooking and i was trying out new recipes from my travels and he was like hey why don't you call me over for dinner so he kind of invited himself over for dinner and and then of course uh, he never left <laughs> <laughs> so how did it go from there to getting married when i met siddharth he told me very clearly and he's not looking to be in a committed relationship that was the second conversation that we had over dinner 
And I was like, I just met you and I was trying to get to know you. So what makes you think that I want to get into a committed relationship with you? He was like, I just like to lay it on the table. He said it in a very graceful way. It's not like I was looking for something with this guy. I just enjoyed his company. It really went on from there that we just had a, a great time together because there was no expectation. I wasn't looking to be in a relationship with him. He wasn't looking to be in a relationship with me. And we were just so comfortable. Every time we met, we never wanted to leave. It really grew from there. And I actually realized that I had fallen in love with him. We met in June 2007. In 2008, around Feb, I told him, listen, I'm in love with you. And if this is not going to go anywhere, I actually don't want to continue meeting you because I think it's unfair to me. <laughs> because if you're not interested and, I, and I, I'm not going to give anybody else a chance. So he was like, yeah, that's a fair point. Let's try not to meet. <laughs> but he kept calling me. Of course, every time he called me, I'm in love with this guy. I used to go running to meet him. And then I uh, said, listen, you know, let's do one thing. You don't call me. He said, no, we have to be friends. Like, it's not, we, we just oh, have to be classic. friends. Yeah, said, okay, <laughs> I'm not letting you go. So I said, okay, fine. We'll be friends. But you don't call me. I will call you. Of course, he was a gentleman. And he said, okay, I won't do it. And, and I was very sure that I'm not going to call him. Because I was really trying to move away from him. I, I didn't have any hopes that he will change his mind or anything like that. I really believe in like practicality of emotion. And I was just happy that I'd found love. And uh, because I had never fallen in love before that, <laughs> even though I'd been on, I'd been on over a thousand dates with over 500 men because I was single and dating from the age of 16 to the age of 36. But then after a month and a half of no calls, Siddharth calls me and he says, listen, uh, I'm really missing you <laughs> because some very interesting things had happened when we were friends we came to each other's homes and all of that and and on one incident Siddharth saw this electric toothbrush in my bathroom and he was like wow you use an electric toothbrush remember 2007 so, yeah it was 2007 <laughs> I've been like out and about in the world, like a lot of people from our generation, you know, there's so much exposure. So obviously you bring all that back. I had gone to my dentist after a week, I bought him an electronic toothbrush. So it was unconscious. It wasn't like deliberate or anything, but he obviously remembered uh, me every morning when he brushed his teeth. It's called <laughs> neuro-linguistic programming. So we met and I said, listen, I'm in a place where I think I'm ready to get married. I'm just letting you know where I am. If you're not ready, it's fine. But just know that when you're ready, maybe I'm not going to be there. So you should be aware of what I'm feeling. And I've always shared that. I think that's a huge part of honesty without expectation, uh, letting the person know where you are. I think that really is important in a relationship and it really brings you closer if that is destined to be. I think we were in our mid-30s or... Yeah, like, I was 35. when I She was 35, 30. I was 33, 34, whatever. If you're single and over 30... Whether you're a man or a woman in India, as you obviously know, Priyanka, there's, uh, people are either always trying to set you up or there's this whole drama that goes on. So I was not ready to really be in a committed relationship. And that's why I, my opening gambit was, listen, I don't know where you're coming from. And I just want to lay this out because I don't want to waste your time. Because if you're really focused on getting married and having a kid, the clock is ticking, all of that stuff. I didn't say it in that many words. Those are pragmatic and practical aspects. I just said, I, just, I respect your time and I respect your choice. So I just want to put this out over there. And I think that helped, you know, like Simran says, just get everybody the hell to chill out. What we found subsequently after running Flow for a decade, that Various people have different approaches, but one very common approach is like, listen, you know, I'm meeting you at coffee day or at Starbucks, and I want to know if you can meet my parents next week, right? <laughs> That's the very common pattern that we see even today. And I think by taking the approach that I did, strangely and ironically enough, it made us get much closer. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, your story is a, it's a bit unique, right? It doesn't happen very often. You can't be in your mid-30s and actually really chill out especially if you're a woman it, it takes a lot to say okay I'm okay chilling out why were you in that space where you said I'm 35 uh, I don't hear my biological clock I'm okay <laughs> how, how did you manage that I have to really credit my mom my mom raised my brother and I we were 
brought my mom was single as in I lost my father when I was two years old. Her whole thing was that get married for the right reasons. I'd never seen a couple. I was very unaware. So in my head, I never even thought about it as a big deal. But I did want to have a child because I understood that, like being a mummy. But we don't know where daddy is. He's right here <laughs> now. But I actually looked at two options when I was 34. I used to travel to the US a lot. I looked at getting a sperm donor to have a baby on my own. I also looked at the option of freezing my eggs right here in India. I did all my homework. And the doctor that I spoke to uh, in Bombay who had that facility to freeze your eggs actually discouraged me because we did all my tests. He said, you're very healthy. I don't really see any problem, even if it's a later conception. So why don't we wait a couple of years? And if you still don't find someone, then we can exercise this option because it was also very expensive to do that. (laughs) So it's not like I did not think about my biological clock. I absolutely did. But what I realized was that there were other options than to be in a miserable marriage or to get married for the sake of having a baby. I I was very clear that I will not marry for the wrong reasons. So I never felt that pressure. Really cool. Uh, Now talk to me a little bit about once you guys got married, what was life like? Did life change after you got married. Do you remember what the first couple of years looked like? You know, see, one thing that I was obviously conscious of is that I'm displacing someone from their habitat and getting them into mine. And the informal prenup, it was that you will not move any furniture. And she was like, okay, that's fine with me. But on the more serious note, I think it was just to know that when you're sort of relocated, if not dislocated, you have to accommodate for that as a major transition. For example, just simple things like what's the closet space available as a single guy i have you know one closet maybe two that's all i need you need at least two more if there's another person and maybe three those were things that we had to make sure it wasn't her because we're we're together but this is your house can i put a cupboard over here you know that kind of a thing but i think there's definitely like a huge transition when anybody gets married, right? This is just an obvious uh, statement. And I think the way to handle that is to be really super aware of what that transition means to different people, right? What does it mean to me? What does it mean to her? What does it mean to our ecosystem? Because my parents live in the same house, but just on a different floor. For me, actually coming into his house, like this point, I think he made it really easy for me. So I didn't really feel uh, any different. I'd change houses so many times. It was just changing into another house for me. Of course, he was very sweet, though. Uh, And I should give credit to someone else for this advice. But a cousin of mine told me that, you know, because you're going to live with your in-laws, you must tell your husband that you stay out of that relationship and let me form my own relationship. And you don't go through him. You go direct to your in-laws. And that, I think, was such great advice because I live with them. We've been now 12 years married and I love my in-laws. I'm so close to them, like my own parents. And it's a void for me that is filled up having his dad. But had he tried to like circumvent and, you know, not that we didn't have issues. Of course, when you start living together, I'm raised differently. I treat staff in a very different way than my mother-in-law. We had to go through all of those, but had committed to understanding each other and giving each other that space. It worked. Between Siddharth and me, he's very zen-like. I'm very fiery. Our music tastes are very different. So we have to like accommodate for that. And it is hard work even for him and me. I think communication is the key to keep each other updated on what's going on. And I think if you have that bedrock, then it became very smooth for us. Because from the beginning, I was very open about how I felt. And so was he. It, it worked out really fun. The tough time that we had was after our baby was born. Because till I got married, I felt like nothing has changed. But once the baby came, that's when we had a, you know, and that way I have to thank his Vipassana. Because you don't know what's happening to you, especially I was 38 when I had my baby and I had no idea what was happening. Did you discover anything new about each other after you started living together that you really liked? Where there was no way to actually find out this particular aspect about each other while you were dating, but you only figured out when you started living together. I had no idea how 
uh, intuitive Siddharth is and how caring he is, okay? Like we were trying to take both uh, his mom and my mom for a holiday in 2014. I said, my mom can fly from Delhi to, we were going to Krabi. I said, mommy can go from Delhi to Bangkok and we'll meet in Bangkok and go. And he was like, no, Sim, I think your mom will be more careful, uh, more comfortable if she comes with us so let her come to De- Bangalore then we'll fly together now you know I mean I wouldn't have known this part about him if uh, <laughs> we were not what do you think of a guy who says that you know I don't want to get married on the first like his opening line is that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to make out all this zen like uh... so I find that you know that deep care uh, you know and, and I, I actually want to acknowledge it and I'm using this platform to acknowledge it that I, I notice it and I'm Appreciate it, grateful, and I love him even more for that. Why, thank you so much. <laughs> that is lovely. <laughs> Good. One win from the conversation, right? No, I think it's really sweet. What about you, Sid? What did you um, discover about Simon that you really liked after you got married? Well, I think, you know, the, the good thing is that it's not something new. After 12 years of being married and maybe a couple of years before that, we can still really talk as if it's, we're still on our first date. Yeah. When you're on your first date, you're always discovering new things. Right? <laughs> so I think, I think if you have a beginner's mind over there, chances of you getting bored are zero. And, <laughs> and I, think, I think, you know, we're, there have been times, I'll tell you, when we are supposed to be going out for a party. This is a true story, yeah. right? And this has happened multiple times. So we're getting ready. And then before I call the Uber, I said, I feel really good. You know, we're dressed up and everything. Let me get a drink. And then, you know, I'll get a drink and then we start chatting. And then we say, hey, screw the party, man. We have a great <laughs> time over here. <laughs> <laughs> or sometimes, you know, we're... You're driven we're, and come back. We're driven. <laughs> Supposing I'm driving, we drive there. We're just chatting and chatting and chatting. And we're like, hey, you know, maybe we should take this party back home instead <laughs> yeah. of like going somewhere else. So I think that refresh rate, if you will, right, is so high. So I think I'm, I'm still discovering things. That's the essence of a great relationship, right? Where you feel like you have so much to talk about even after years of being married to each other and the conversation is so organic. What's the relationship like now? I, I, I actually look at it as, as transitions. When you get married is a huge transition. When you become parents, that's a massive transition. Along the way, there are probably going to be one or two other big transitions. And then the third big transition really is when kids are out of the house. In the middle, you could have job changes. And I think those are the points in all seriousness that one needs to be extra vigilant because that's when it's not status quo. And it means huge amounts of change are are underway. And change for one typically means some change for the other. I think we've handled them intuitively quite well. Now I've obviously been able to articulate it almost as a model. I think just being really grounded, because I don't think that the day-to-day really bothers me. There are ways to navigate that as long as it's done without any covert expectation, what I call covert contracts being unstated in, in that action. That's a fantastic way of looking at it, right? Let's talk about another big transition for you guys, which is starting a company. How did that decision impact your relationship? And did your relationship have an impact on this it started very organically with me helping out Siddharth and Sid, who were trying to start a company. I was already working in a recruiting firm with my brother. So I actually suggested the idea. They wanted to do something with some social aspect to it. And, and then I started helping them with the screening process. I got like really excited. And the events part came in and I love organizing events. It's always been a passion of mine and it comes really easily. I enjoy it. So it started with me just helping them out. And then soon I became like, like the ops person because none of them had done ops before and I had done a lot of ops. I started enjoying this more than the recruiting, which was very time bound. I had a 10 month old baby. It was very competitive. So I actually took a call to just switch. We, I don't think we thought through it like, should we work together? Should we not work together? We just went with the flow. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and she came up with the name of the company also. Yeah. Since I'd already worked with my brother, I knew how to work when you're in some kind of a relationship. And really, it was in my head, I was very clear that what is my competency? I will stick with that and I'm not going to question. We did a good job of divvying up 
like who will do what and and i think we both uh, handled it really well in terms of at work i have a slightly different view it worked and like they say don't try this at home it's not for everybody right yeah, it's yeah. really not for everybody that's a, a bit of a minefield that you've got to navigate unless you're sort of a natural at it i would not say that that's the default sure there are a lot of great yeah. couples that have worked and that have you know done great things together but i think what what i found was extremely useful keeping aside all the you know research and everything if i really had to boil it down to one fundamental first principle it would be like listen my relationship is more important than the startups or anything else and i think that drives so much of the rest of everything that you build on top of it there's never been a debate in my mind there's been ultra clarity over there and i think from from that point on it's actually much easier than to do that and not all founders have that um, liberty if you're venture backed it's a very different sort of gig etc outside of work how did your worlds converge and how did they diverge friends social life hobbies did they align somewhere or were they different at the foundational level we are individuals so you've got to have your own spaces you've got to have your own circles you've got to have your own friends not everybody's going to like everybody right so that space and that respect is always offered to each other that being said if there are people in the ecosystem that either one of us is uncomfortable with and typically that would be either their value systems don't you know jive with us there's this sort of a, a sexual undercurrent or something like that then i'd say that just disengage don't be ideological about it i think if they just see nobody's crimping on your liberty but i think you've got to also take the practical aspect of how much do you respect your partner and really does that other person mean as much to you as your partner does and obviously the answer in all cases in our situation is always no it really doesn't matter the other thing that i will say is that it's a const- we're constantly evolving we're constantly evolving as individuals we're constantly evolving as couples we con- our friends are constantly evolving as individual and in our case most of our friends are couples i mean we do have a few single friends but for the most part they're in our age group etc so i think that dynamic also has to be contemplated because you might have been close to someone as a couple as an individual 5 years ago but they are on a different trajectory now and you're on a different trajectory now I, there's no judgement over here it's just different people have different priorities at different points in their life we've always maintained that individuality in our relationship so there are some friends of mine who i definitely meet alone and and <laughs> sometimes the thought wants to join me but we are like no we don't want you to join us <laughs> <laughs> like 2 years ago i used to take trips alone just me nobody else i had built my life around that i was single for so long so i i need that input of being with myself and and i've done that it's something that's known to him he likes to go away. in fact uh, he wasn't doing it consciously and and in 2019 i actually sent him away for 2 days by himself because i think we really need that space entertainment wise we do a lot of stuff with our daughter now he plays his sax and he goes for his saxophone class and all of that i like to sing and i do my own uh, thing over there i actually don't think that you have to be doing stuff together because that's how i think we're able to maintain our individuality because our experience absolutely that's material for conversation right is there a sort of mantra for your relationship one thing that i think a lot of couples lose around is the romance i think is really important i don't know but i am very romantic in the middle of the day even when we were working together like i'd send sarath like some love messages in fact one of the things that I, he secretly liked was that i used to send him message on every forum whatsapp sms slack email i used to do this mass as to cut copy paste everything i used to send him like a mass love message with a lot of emojis gifs you know i'm listening to a song it makes me think of him i'll immediately share it dedicate it to him which he started doing this to me now so you know just to do these little, little things that, that to let your spouse know that you're thinking about them and you still are excited about being with them the question that i always come back to on a daily basis like who are the most important people in my life and and if i can keep reinforcing that i don't take anything for granted and i don't think we can i think that's really the bedrock of my 
life system, if you will. And, and then it also allows one to then focus on really what you really value. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, coming to the final question of today's conversation. Could you guys share a favorite memory with each other? We went on a pre-honeymoon. Before we got married, I was actually scheduled to go to the US for a, a two-month gig that I was doing with a musician. Last minute, we decided to get married. And he then came on that trip. So I was going to stop for a week in France and then go to Prague. Prague. Yeah. So he actually, you know, so he decided like, Five days before, we got express visas and all that. And then he came for that trip. We had a fantastic time. That is one of my favorite times with Siddharth. Every morning. So I wake up at an unearthly hour, like very early. And she saunters out of bed at about seven, right? So at at 6.55 every morning, I've got to make the tea. (laughs) Everybody has their own chai, right? uh, So there's as many varieties of chai as there are Indians. So hers has this whatever, only cardamom, no ginger, blah, blah, blah. All of that I mean, like <laughs> so I start the whole ritual. The, ritual, the tea ceremony begins at 6.55 and then it's done by 7. And there's the pounding of the cardamom in the kitchen, right? So that wakes up the whole house. It's also like a morning alarm service for the entire house. And so then she will come out at 7 o'clock and I'll say, hey, your tea is ready. And that, that look on her face is like, wow, man. Yeah. That's, that's my fondest memory. It's like, <laughs> okay, we're off to a good start. <laughs> there were so many insights from my conversation today. Simran and Siddharth were in their mid-30s when they first met. Approximately the same age most people are looking to get married these days. Yet, They stayed clear from putting any pressure on themselves and allowed their relationship to take its natural course. This takes a tremendous level of self-awareness and confidence that most people struggle with today. Sometimes giving relationships time helps you discover new things about each other that are pleasantly surprising. What was also reinforced in our conversation today is how prioritizing your relationship makes it so much easier to navigate everything else. Thank you for listening to Behind the Scenes. These conversations are available on the Marriage Broker Auntie channel on YouTube and Spotify. Please subscribe to our channel if you haven't already done so, so you can have access to future episodes as soon as they're out. Much has been said about how we meet our partners, but very little about how we build relationships with them. So if you think this conversation could inspire someone you know, don't forget to share this with them. If you'd like to follow us on social media, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter. You can also go to our website marriagebrokerauntie.com, auntie with an I-E, to learn more about this project and the work we do.